You are about to take a complete TOEFL IBT practice test. It's gonna take almost three hours and include all four sections. You may have seen some of these videos before. They're from previous videos that I made. I took these past videos and combined them to make a complete TOEFL test so you can experience the test just like it will be on test day. Well, pretty similar. It's not an interactive test, it's a video, but it'll be the same length and the same questions and it'll feel pretty similar. Check out tsdprep.com if you need more TOEFL practice, you need teachers, you need uh, more advice, uh, we have evaluations, all, all the TOEFL stuff you need is at TSC Prep. And oh yeah, also uh, be sure to subscribe. It helped me a lot. That's it. Good luck, everybody. I will see you at the end. You're about to take a complete practice test for the TOEFL IBT. This time it's about the reading section. So my name is Josh. I'm from TST Prep. And there are a few differences between this test and the real TOEFL. So let's talk about them really quickly. First thing to keep in mind is that on test day, the passage will be on the right and the questions will be on the left. For this practice, to make the text bigger and easier to read, each paragraph is above each question that it's connected to. The second thing to keep in mind is that this is practice, so there are answers. The answers are in the description. You can download the PDF in the description for answer explanations, if you need more explanation for why a question is correct or incorrect. And also if you need more explanation, leave a comment. We, I answer pretty much every comment that's there. So if you have a question, definitely leave it in the comments. On test day, you're in control of your time. But for this YouTube video, I give you a minute and 45 seconds, the same length of time you have to complete the entire reading section, which is 54 minutes to finish three passages. The last thing to keep in mind is visit tstprep.com. We have courses, classes, practice, and evaluations, teachers, everything you need to prepare for the TOEFL. Check it out, tstprep.com. That's it. Good luck, TEFL, TOEFL test takers. <laughs> I'll see you uh, at the end.
You're about to take a complete practice test for the TOEFL IBT listening section. My name's Josh, I'm from TST Prep, and there are a couple of differences between this test and the actual TOEFL. So the first difference is that on test day, you're in control of your time. So if you wanna just take five seconds to answer a question, or you wanna take a minute to answer a question, it's up to you. But for this practice on YouTube, each question has the same length of time for you to complete. So keep that in mind. The second thing is that there is a link in the description below to a PDF with explanations for all of the answers. So if you need more explanation for why something is correct or incorrect, definitely check that out. Also, you'll see all the answers in the description. So again, answers are in the description. And if you need more help with courses, classes, more practice questions, check out tscprep.com. Use coupon code tscprep-josh for 10% off. But that's it. Hope you guys find this helpful. Good luck, test takers. And I will see you at the end. Now listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. Good morning, Professor Jacobs. How was your weekend? Hi, Jane. My weekend was great. Very relaxing. How about yours? I had a blast. I went to an exhibition at a gallery in the city, and one of the artists was there. I got to meet him. Unfortunately, I don't remember his name, but he does drip art just like Jackson Pollock. It was really cool and inspiring to meet someone who creates art for a living. Wow, what an exciting weekend. And it sounds like you really have found some inspiration for your drip art project. How is that coming along? Well, that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about. I think drip art is really unique and interesting, but I'm having trouble with the assignment. Well, what seems to be the problem? I started working on the project right after going to the exhibit, but I feel like I'm stuck and I'm worried I won't be able to create a piece that I'm comfortable handing in. How so? Are you confused about the assignment? I think I understand the assignment well, but you know how you always tell us to express ourselves in our art? That's why I feel frustrated with this project. I feel like I'm forcing myself to create something, and it just feels fake. What would you do if you were in my shoes? I completely understand your concern, but that's the whole point of my class. I want you to get out of your comfort zone. Let go and try something new. Okay, I'll give it another shot today, and I'll see if I can push past the feeling of being stuck. That's a good idea. And if you're still feeling uneasy, I'm having a workshop this Saturday, and you can join it if you like. You can see some examples of drip art and watch the actual process. That may be really helpful for you. If you stay for a little while afterward, we can discuss any further questions you may have. That sounds great. Thank you so much. I would love to attend the workshop. I think that it's just what I need to help me finish this project. You're welcome. I'm glad you stopped by. I'd rather you be confused and ask questions than say nothing and struggle with the project. I'll see you on Saturday. Now, answer the questions. 1. Why does the student want to talk to the professor? 2. What does the student mean when she says the assignment feels fake? 3. Listen again to part of the passage. Why does the professor say this? I completely understand your concern, but that's the whole point of my class. I want you to get out of your comfort zone. Let go and try something new.
Four, what suggestions does the professor make to the student? Select two. Five, why does the professor suggest the student attend his workshop? Now listen to part of a talk in an economics class. Today we're going to be discussing public goods. So basically, lots of individuals and businesses create new ideas and products every day, and most expect to get some money from their creations. But what happens when you make something that has such a tremendous benefit to society that you can't expect to receive any money in return? This kind of good is a public good. Can anyone think of examples of a public good? Well, I'm not so sure, but maybe some of the TV channels on basic cable. I mean, anyone with a TV and an antenna can get some channels to watch. Yes, I didn't think of that before. But you're right, Sam. Basic cable channels are a public good. Another example might be a country's national defense or military. These exist purely to benefit the people. Professor, is there any way to kind of judge whether a product is a public or private good? I mean, like those TV channels, they might be free, but you still need to buy a TV. So I guess I'm just not sure how you can tell if something is a public good. Yes, this idea can be a bit confusing. I guess it's best to contrast it with a private good, say a piece of pizza. A piece of pizza can be bought and sold pretty easily. And one of the reasons why is because it's so easy to separate. I suppose one of the most defining characteristics of public goods is that they are almost impossible to separate. TV airways and the national defense system are not things you can really break down into pieces. It's the same with public Wi-Fi. Many cities are now offering free Wi-Fi to residents. Wi-Fi only exists in the air. You can't hold Wi-Fi and separate it into pieces. Oh, okay, professor. I think I get it now. But in the book, they mention the terms non-excludable and non-rivalrous when trying to explain public goods, and I didn't really get it. Great. I was just going to get to that. So, besides being hard to separate, economists usually classify something as a public good if it is both non-excludable and non-rivalrous. Now, I know these terms are quite a mouthful, but they are fairly simple ideas. Let's start with non-excludable. Non-excludable means that it is either expensive or nearly impossible to exclude someone from using the good. Uh, let's say an individual, who we will call Larry, buys a private good like a piece of pizza. Then he can exclude others from eating that pizza. However, if national defense is being provided, then it includes everyone. If you strongly disagree with your country's defense policies, the national defense still protects you. You cannot choose to be unprotected, and national defense cannot protect everyone else and exclude you. The second main characteristic of a public good is that it is non-rivalrous, which means that when one person uses the public good, another can also use it. With a private good like pizza, if our subject Larry is eating the pizza, then another person cannot eat it. That is, the two people are rivals in consumption. With a public good like national defense, Larry's consumption of national defense does not reduce the amount for others, so they are non-rivalrous in this area. A number of government services are also examples of public goods. For instance, it would not be easy to provide fire and police service for some people in a given neighborhood, but not everyone. 
Protecting some necessarily means protecting others too. Paying for public goods is always a challenging dilemma for both business leaders and politicians. The key insight in paying for public goods is to find a way of assuring that everyone will make a contribution. For example, if people come together through the political process and agree to pay taxes and make group decisions about the quantity of public goods, then they can all feel like they are being treated equally because everyone contributes. Now, answer the questions. 1. What is the lecture mainly about? Two, how is the lecture organized? Three, based on the information from the listening, indicate which characteristic on the left belongs to either non-excludable, non-rival, or neither. This question is worth two points. Four, what is an example of a public good? Select two. Five, what is the professor implying when she says this? So besides being hard to separate, economists usually classify something as a public good if it is both non-excludable and non-rivalrous. Now, I know these terms are quite a mouthful, but they are fairly simple ideas. Six, why does the professor talk about pizza during the lecture? Now listen to part of a talk in a psychology class. Now that we're on the topic of memory, it's a good time to talk about the case of Henry Mollison. Okay, so where to start? Well, Henry Mollison was better known as H.M. in the scientific community. You see, he is probably, mm, no, definitely, the most important patient 
in the history of neuroscience. Before his death in 2008, Mullison was the subject of over 1,200 research articles. So, what made H.M. so special? Well, a little background about his life. Mullison had epilepsy, which is when you lose control of much of your body and start having seizures. Well, by the age of 27, H.M.'s seizures were getting much worse. In an attempt to control his seizures, H.M. underwent brain surgery to remove very important pieces of his brain, his hippocampus and his amygdala. I'll put that on the board here. So, the doctor in charge of this procedure believed it would cure his epilepsy. Well, he was right in that H.M.'s seizures almost completely stopped. But there was an even more drastic and devastating consequence of this procedure. Mollison lost his ability to create new memories. This is referred to in medical terminology as severe anterograde amnesia, and I'll put that on the board too. You see, Henry no longer had the ability to make conscious memories of specific facts like names, dates, and recent happenings. So, if you introduced yourself to Henry at any time after the surgery, within 30 seconds of your introduction, he would completely forget ever meeting you. H.M. would wake up every day in the same state of mind he had before the surgery. He could not make any new conscious memories. In 1962, about 10 years after his surgery, a young surgeon named Suzanne Corkin met H.M. and realized that while a tragedy in most respects, H.M.'s condition provided her with a unique opportunity to analyze the function of specific areas of the brain and how they relate to learning and memory. Even though he suffered from amnesia, much of Henry's brain function besides memory remained intact. He was a friendly guy. Also, since he had almost no short-term memory ability, he would never get tired of the boring brain activities needed for the research. Studying H.M.'s brain led to some fascinating discoveries in the field of neuroscience. Up until the 20th century, neuroscience had very little understanding of how the brain worked. H.M.'s rewired brain quickly proved that memory was not spread throughout the brain. Henry's acute anterograde amnesia had little effect on his self-knowledge or intelligence prior to the age of 25. Henry's case and others like it soon revealed that declarative long-term memories are stored in the area of the brain known as the hippocampus. Through HM, researchers discovered that the brain possesses multiple systems for storing and retrieving memories that are dispersed in different but specific locations in the brain. HM could not form any new conscious memories after his surgery, but he could improve on his ability to perform tasks. It soon became clear that the brain had another type of memory system, called muscle memory, which did not rely on conscious memories. In one of her experiments, Corkin would have H.M. sketch a figure through the reflection of a mirror. This is a challenging task that takes time to practice and master. Mollison had developed a new skill subconsciously through repetition. Sometimes referred to as motor learning, H.M. confirmed that new skills can be learned through repetition over time disassociated from conscious memories. This doesn't mean that skills like playing the piano or drawing a face rely solely on muscle memory. However, it plays a much bigger role in our retention of skills than previously suspected. While there were some benefits for research, Henry's unique amnesia made it almost impossible for him to remember any new events after the surgery. For example, the death of his parents occurred later in his life, and he couldn't remember it. Whenever he was reminded of his parents' demise, the pain returned as if he were hearing it again for the first time. Now, answer the questions. One. What is the lecture mainly about?
2. How does the professor organize the lecture? Three, what does the professor imply about Henry Mollison's situation? Four, after his surgery, why would Henry Mollison forget about meeting someone 30 seconds later? Five, how is Henry Mollison able to develop new skills? Six, why does the professor say this? In an attempt to control his seizures, H.M. underwent brain surgery to remove very important pieces of his brain, his hippocampus and his amygdala. Now I'll put that on the board here. Now listen to a conversation between a student and an IT worker. Hi, I have a big problem that I need your help with. What's going on? Well, I was just at the library to print some stuff off for class, and when I went to open my laptop and get started, the screen went blank, and all these funny symbols started showing up. Then my computer just turned off. I don't know what to do. My computer won't turn back on. I'm scared that something bad happened, like a virus, or it crashed. Oh dear, that sounds like a potential virus to me. Let me take a look at your computer so I can try and scan and find the problem. Did you back up your work? You know what? It's really weird, but I actually just backed up everything this morning onto my external hard drive, which I haven't done in a really long time. It's like I just had a feeling something was going to happen, and now I can't believe that something actually is wrong. That's really lucky that you backed everything up, because in this situation, who knows if you'll be able to get everything back. It will take time for me to scan it and see what's the problem. Hopefully I won't have to, but I may need to clean the hard drive, in which case you would lose any information on your computer. If you prefer, you can take it to the company where you bought your computer and have them take a look, but that could cost you at least $500. That's crazy. I trust you, though, and I think whatever you decide is best. That's what I'll do. I don't want to spend $500 if they're just going to tell me the same thing you would. Okay, I'll go ahead and keep your computer here, and I'll send you an email when the scan is done, and I'll find out what's going on and what can be done to fix it. Do you know how long that's going to take? I still need to print some files for class. 
Well, I can't say for sure, but I think you should take your external hard drive to the library and print your files off at the library computers in the meantime. Besides, if I have to swipe your hard drive, there won't be anything on your laptop to print. That's true. Well, at least that fire's put out. Now, I just have to worry about my computer getting back to normal. Now, answer the questions. 1. What problem is the student having? 2. What does the IT worker imply when she tells the student he is lucky that he backed up his files? Three, listen again to part of the passage. What does the student mean when he says this? That's true. Well, at least that fire's put out. Now, I just have to worry about my computer getting back to normal. Four, listen again to part of the passage. What does the IT worker imply when she says this? If you prefer, you can take it to the company where you bought your computer and have them take a look, but that could cost you at least $500. Five, when will the IT worker be done fixing the student's computer? Now listen to part of a talk in a sociology class. Today we are going to discuss marriage, and more importantly, we want to study how the idea of marriage interacts with the society as a whole. In other words, we want to know how observing marriages in different cultures can help us learn a bit more about the larger community. So, when we sociologists want to study families, we must first have a perspective, um, a kind of lens to look through. You might remember from the reading the idea of functionalism. In sociology, functionalism is when you look at a society and individuals within a society as filling a role or a function. They have to serve some purpose. Let's use this lens, the perspective of functionalism, to examine marriage. When considering the role of families in societies, Functionalists believe that they play a key role in stabilizing the culture. The family performs certain tasks that help a society grow and develop. After a series of tests, 
sociologist George Murdoch has determined that there are three universal functions of the family, sexual, reproductive, and educational. According to Murdoch, the family, which for him includes the state of marriage, regulates sexual relations between individuals. He does not deny the existence of sex outside of marriage, but states that the family offers a socially approved sexual outlet for adults. This outlet gives way to reproduction, which is a necessary part of ensuring the survival of society. Once children are produced, the family plays a vital role in training them for adult life. The family teaches young children the ways of thinking and behaving that follow social and cultural values and beliefs. Basically, parents teach their children how to be good citizens in a given culture. But that's just the functional perspective. There are other lenses to look through. Conflict theory looks at a society as a constant state of fighting, since two individuals, families, governments, and so on are competing for a limited number of resources. Conflict theorists are quick to point out that American families have a more individualistic style of thinking. Many Americans are resistant to government intervention in the family. Parents do not want the government to tell them how to raise their children or to become involved in domestic issues. Conflict theory highlights the role of power in family life and that individuals within families are constantly struggling for control. Let's look at the division of labor within the family home as an example. Most family members don't get paid for washing dishes and vacuuming carpets. However, studies indicate that when men do more housework, women experience more satisfaction in their marriages, reducing the incidence of conflict and increasing the woman's power. In general, conflict theorists tend to study areas of marriage and life that involve inequalities in power and authority, as they are reflective of the larger social structure. Now, there is one more popular lens that many sociologists look through, and that's symbolic interactionism. Interactionists view the world in terms of symbols and the meanings assigned to them. The family itself is a symbol. To some, it is a father, mother, and children. To others, it's any union that involves respect and compassion. Interactionists stress that family is a social phenomenon that changes meaning based on the time, place, and culture. Consider what it means to be a father or a mother. At one time, it was a symbol of biological connection to a child. However, many children now are no longer raised by their biological parents, but still call them mother and father. Interactionists also realize how the roles within families are socially constructed. Interactionists view the family as a group of role players, or actors, that come together to act out their parts in an effort to construct a family. These roles are up for interpretation. Now, just to recap, if we view the family through a functional lens, then we see actions based on how it contributes to a society as a whole. If we look through a conflict theory lens, then we see family interactions as a power struggle between individuals. And if we look through the symbolic interactionist lens, then we view the actions of families as filling a role they are expected to play, and that role can change over time. Which one do you think is the most useful perspective to have on contemporary American marriages? Now, answer the questions. 1. What is the lecture mainly about? 2. Why does the professor discuss sociologist George Murdoch? 3. How is the lecture organized? 
4, the professor discusses several perspectives on marriage and family unit. Indicate which information matches each type of perspective. This question is worth two points. Five, according to sociologist George Murdoch, what are the three universal functions of the family? Six, why does the professor say this? Which one do you think is the most useful perspective to have on contemporary American marriages? You're about to take a complete practice test for the TOEFL IBT speaking section. Lots of students find this section to be a challenge, so let's do it together. Take a deep breath and let's do a few things before you get ready to speak. The first thing is to get ready to record your voice. Get a, uh, you know, a phone or an app that you can record your voice and listen back to it later so you can evaluate your own speaking. You'll find speaking templates and a grading rubric. I believe it's the TOEFL Speaking 26 guide. Download that, it has a lot of good information, it's free, and you can use a self-grading checklist there to help you give yourself a score. There will be sample responses at the end, so if you watch this video, uh, you'll questions one, two, three, and four will just come up like they normally will on test day. Uh, but at the end, after question four, I will give some sample responses so you can listen to them. Uh, I didn't want to mess up the flow of the test and give it after each question, so at the end of the video, you'll see them there. If you need more help with the speaking in particular, I have a pretty new program. It's a TOEFL speaking study plan. It can last up to 90 days, but it's guaranteed to improve your score in 30 days. Seriously, and it takes less than 15 minutes a day to do. It's a new project, it's at speakerenglish.com. Check it out, I'll put a link in the description below. Lots of links in the description below. Uh, hope you find them all helpful. That's it, good luck everybody. Get ready to speak and I'll see you at the end. Directions. You will now be asked a question about a familiar topic. After you hear the question, you will have 15 seconds to plan your response and 45 seconds to speak. Do you agree or disagree with the following statement? Teenagers should work while they go to school so they can learn how to be more responsible. Provide details and examples to explain your opinion. You have 15 seconds to prepare your response. You may begin preparing now. You now have 45 seconds to speak. You may begin speaking now.
Directions. You will now read a short passage and then listen to a conversation on the same topic. You will then be asked a question about the passages. After you hear the question, you will have 30 seconds to prepare your response and 60 seconds to speak. You have 45 seconds to read the passage below. You may begin reading now. Now listen to a conversation about the same topic. Hey, Lisa, did you read Johnny's letter in the school paper? Yeah, I'm just finishing it now, actually. I can't believe you finally complained about it. Yeah, and I think it's great. Almost everyone I talk to agrees that the cafeteria should be more flexible when it comes to meal plans. I mean, I'm not crazy about the cafeteria's food, but I like to go there to meet up with friends and hang out. I'd buy a 50 meal plan, for example. But I would never get the yearly meal plan. Yeah, I guess you have a point, but won't this make meals more expensive? I'm on the school's meal plan right now, and the one thing I love about it is the price. It's so cheap. I don't see why a new meal plan structure would affect the price of the current system. It's basically just adding more options. Even though I might have to pay more per meal for my plan, it fits my schedule better. This type of structure is going to make everyone happy both the students who don't plan on eating at the cafeteria every day, and the school, which can make a bit more money from the variety of options. And even students like you who already are on the meal plan won't be affected by this change. I guess you're right. Maybe Johnny will get what he wants after all. Now, answer the question. The man expresses his opinion on cafeteria meal plans. State his opinion and explain the reason he gives for holding that opinion. You have 30 seconds to prepare your response. You may begin preparing now. You now have 60 seconds to speak. You may begin speaking now. Directions. You will now read a short passage and then listen to a lecture on the same topic. You will then be asked a question about the passage. After you hear the question, you will have 30 seconds to prepare your response and 60 seconds to speak. You have 45 seconds to read the passage below. You may begin reading now.
Now listen to a lecture about this topic in a behavioral psychology class. Okay, so you may have never heard of the terms instrumental and expressive before when it comes to leadership, but I bet you could think of a couple people who fit these descriptions. Now, I used to have a part-time job working as a waitress at a restaurant. I had a boss named Bill who was a typical instrumental leader. Not only was he good at managing his business, but he also had extensive experience as a waiter. He had high standards in the way we treated customers, and he expected all of us to do the same. The waiters were almost completely forbidden to speak with one another while at work, even when we didn't have any customers. He felt that if we focused on our tasks and the customers, not on each other, we wouldn't get distracted or become lazy. He did have a successful restaurant, but there were certainly other approaches he could have taken that weren't so strict. You know, my boss right now is Professor Green, the head of the department. She really knows how to treat the university staff with respect. While there are rules we have to follow and deadlines we must meet, she hardly ever pressures us. She treats us like adults, and we, the teaching staff, all do our jobs to the best of our abilities because we don't want to disappoint or upset her. She holds weekly staff meetings so we can communicate about problems in class and even holds parties at her home once a month. We all feel like a part of an open and honest team, and that would not be possible without her expressive type of leadership. Now, answer the question. Using the examples from the lecture, describe two types of leadership. You have 30 seconds to prepare your response. You may begin preparing now. You now have 60 seconds to speak. You may begin speaking now. Directions. You will now listen to part of a lecture. You will then be asked a question about it. After you hear the question, you will have 20 seconds to prepare your response and 60 seconds to speak. Now listen to part of a lecture in a psychology class. We spend approximately one-third of our lives sleeping. Given that the average life expectancy for most of us falls between 73 and 79 years old, we can expect to spend approximately 25 years of our lives sleeping. Surprisingly, the reason why we humans sleep is still mostly a mystery, but there are a few theories that attempt to explain the function of sleep. One popular hypothesis argues that sleep is essential in order for us humans to restore the resources we use throughout the day. The same way that bears hibernate in the winter when resources are scarce, Perhaps people sleep at night to reduce the amount of energy they use. It has recently become fashionable to argue that people need to sleep at least eight hours in a night in order to function at their optimal physical and mental capacity. I'm sure all of you have felt pretty sluggish after a late night with just a few hours of sleep, so this theory makes sense intuitively. However, there are others who are not convinced by this simplistic explanation of why we sleep, 
and have proposed other explanations. Another popular theory proposes that sleep is an adaptive response to predatory risk. In other words, our great ancestors were more likely to be hunted and killed at night by other animals, so a desire to sleep in a safe, comfortable area was an evolutionary mechanism that helped shield us from harm. As I'm sure you are all aware, there are more risks at nighttime since visibility is so low. We haven't adapted our senses in the same way other creatures have to survive throughout the night. Accordingly, it makes sense to believe that sleep is a biological response to our environmental conditions, but, just like the theory involving energy conservation, there are some who disagree. Now, answer the question. Using points and examples from the talk, describe the two theories that explain why humans sleep. You have 20 seconds to prepare your response. You may begin preparing now. You now have 60 seconds to speak. You can begin speaking now. As a matter of fact, I do agree that teenagers should work in order to learn more about personal responsibility. For example, when I was in high school, I worked as a custodian at another school in our district. In the summer, I worked from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. five days a week with a bunch of blue-collar middle-aged men who had worked hard their entire lives. Not only did I have to lift heavy objects and work with complicated machinery, but I also spent time with rugged men who encouraged me to focus on my studies and get a college degree. That's why I think working as a student is a great way to learn about the value of both hard work and a good education. According to the letter, the school's meal plan is too strict and should be more flexible. The man in the conversation completely agrees with this proposal. Even though he's not a big fan of the cafeteria's food, he likes to go there to hang out sometimes. He's not on the school meal plan right now, but if they had a flexible 50 meal plan, for example, he would take advantage of it. On top of that, he believes adding this option will satisfy everyone. Students can still go to the cafeteria once in a while for the occasional meal. And the school can earn a bit more revenue with the increase in school lunch purchases. The prices wouldn't change, only the number of options. This basically sums up why the man likes the idea of changing the school's meal plan. This is a fascinating topic. According to the author, there are two main types of leaders, instrumental and expressive. The lecture provides two excellent and personal examples of each type to further illustrate this idea. First, she talks about her old boss, Bill, who is a typical instrumental leader. Bill was very professional and kept the staff focused on their work and customers, of course. 
Some employees didn't like Bill because they thought he was too strict, though. In contrast, the lecturer now works under Professor Green, and she's an expressive type of leader. She's respectful of the staff and holds weekly meetings for them to communicate about their problems. The professor seems to prefer expressive leadership because everyone feels more like a part of the team. So there you have it. Those are the two types of leadership discussed in the passages. So the professor is talking about sleep, and more specifically, he's describing two main theories about why we sleep. One idea is that we need sleep in order to restore the resources we use throughout the day. Similar to a hibernating bear, people need sleep to restore their energy. The common thought is that eight hours is needed for people to function at their best. But there is another theory that says people sleep because of evolution. Our eyes were never adapted to being active at night. So, the idea is that long ago, finding a safe place for shelter at nighttime was a way to avoid predators and stay alive. After continuing this practice, over time, sleeping became something of a biological response to our environment. These are the two theories the professor uses to explain why humans sleep. You're about to take a complete practice test for the TOEFL writing section. Last section of the TOEFL test. You've probably watched the other three videos about reading, listening, and speaking. Last thing, writing. Let's do it together right now. A couple things to keep in mind before we get started. The first thing is that get ready to type without spell check. This is something a lot of students, uh, mistake a lot of students make, is that when you're practicing for the TOEFL, you'll practice on what you normally do, Microsoft Word or Google Docs, but there is an automatic grammar and spelling checker. Make sure you turn that off. That's because on test day, you won't be able to use those. The second thing to keep in mind is that there are sample essays for each question in the description. So download the PDF in the description below. Not only will you see sample essays, but you will also have a, the transcript from the listening for the integrated writing as well. So everything will be there. I'm also going to put a link in the description, lots of links in the description for the Writing 24 Plus guide. It's free and it also has templates and sample essays for you to practice with as well. Don't forget to visit tstprep.com for more practice tests, questions, teachers, courses, anything you need for TOEFL, tstprep.com. We're there for you, whatever you need for TOEFL. But that's it, everybody. Good luck, and I will see you at the end. Last section, let's push through it. Good luck, everybody. Writing task one, directions. For this task, you will read a passage and listen to a lecture about an academic topic. You may take notes during this time. After the passages have finished, you will then be asked a question about them. After the question, you have 20 minutes to write your response. Effective responses are usually between 200 to 350 words. You may look at the reading passage and your notes as you write. Keep in mind that the question will not ask for your opinion. You have three minutes to read. You may begin reading now.
Now listen to part of a lecture on the same topic you just read about. Look, there's no doubt about it. The population of the Earth has increased dramatically in the last century. While the rate of growth may alarm some futurists who believe we will be living in some terrible, dystopian future of scarcity, I disagree with researchers who have such a negative outlook on the future. Here's why. We are now more aware than ever of the diversity of species in various biospheres. We have biologists and researchers who go to great lengths to catalog all known species and measure the likelihood that they may go extinct. Preserving biodiversity is a serious matter. Educational institutions and nonprofit organizations work very hard to ensure that no threatened species ever goes extinct. So, while we still need more drinking water in the future, there's no reason to believe it will lead to the extinction of species. The author sees the future as a place of scarcity, whereas I see it as a place of abundance. New technology has already been developed that can easily filter even the dirtiest water to make it drinkable. There are even machines that produce food that can provide people in need with the caloric intake they need to survive. So my point is that any future wars will not be due to a lack of basic necessities, as the reading claims. As we can see today, all kinds of products are only getting cheaper. Just look at the price you paid for your home computer or cell phone. Such items cost less than ever before, even though they use pretty advanced technology. Moreover, once devices that produce clean drinking water and food become readily available to more people around the globe, Individuals in poorer nations will not have to worry about the price of the basic items they need to live. Now, answer the question. Summarize the points made in the lecture, being sure to explain how they answer the specific problems presented in the reading passage. You have 20 minutes to write.
Directions. For this task, you will write an essay in response to a question that asks you to state, explain, and support your opinion on an issue. Typically, an effective essay will contain a minimum of 300 words. Your essay will be judged based on the quality of your writing. This includes the development of your ideas, the organization of your essay, and the quality and accuracy of the language you use to express your ideas. You have 30 minutes to plan and complete your essay. Question. Your professor has assigned the class with a final project. However, each student is free to choose who they will work with. If you had to work on this kind of project, would you rather work alone, work with classmates, work with a tutor? Use specific reasons and examples to support your essay. Be sure to use your own words. Do not use memorized examples.
congratulations. You have made it to the end. It's like three hours, almost three hours. Really, you know, I, I do this thing at the end because I really am proud of you and I feel like you should be proud of yourself because I know how hard it is to practice this stuff. It, it's, it's draining, it's hard. There's so many other things you could be doing and it's tiring. So reward yourself, be proud of yourself. Uh, if you're, if you need more help, check out tstprep.com. We have courses, classes, teachers, all that stuff. And, but, but anyway, just be proud of yourself. I'm really proud of you. Good job. And if you are, you know, a masochist and you want to punish yourself with more TOEFL practice, you can check out this video here. I'll put it right here and you can do some more practice. All right, but thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.